Members, so welcome to today's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. Members, mobile phones must be set to airplane mode or turned off. It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. This session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed by online streaming either on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. We are in public session. Agenda item one is apologies. Are we any apologies this afternoon, members? <coughs> okay. Uh, agenda item two then is the minutes of the 5th of November, which are in your pack pages 5 to 12. Uh, members, the minutes of the 5th of November, are you content? Great. Permission to sign them? <coughs> Thank you. Um, agenda item three then is the declaration of members' interests. Um, <coughs> At each uh, meeting, members are required to register relevant financial or other interests in the register of members' interest. Does any member have any interest to wish to declare this afternoon? Um, member of the GA. Okay. Any others? Okay. Uh, agenda item four, then, is matters arising. Uh, in your pack, pages 8 to 103, members at last week's meeting, we noted and agreed the second issues <coughs> paper regarding land web project and a digital transformation. Are you content that the second issues paper uh, forms part of our report on land web project and digital transformation? Agreed? Yep. Thank you. We will remain in public session and then agenda item five is correspondence, which is pages 15 up to 29 of your pack. Members are referred to correspondence due to the 30th of October 2020 from Chris Murphy in your pack pages 15 to 19. <coughs> Regarding the report on the major capital projects and the £11 million spent for judicial review of the A6, and that includes a copy of Farron's press release of the 12th of May 2015, the appointed uh, contractor to develop the A6 Randalls Town to Castle Dawson. Members, Mr Murphy has asked that the recommendation number 13 of the major capital projects report is recalled. He states that, and I quote, Recommendation 13 causes me grave concern. It appears to me that the committee may be unduly influenced by an uh, unconscious bias, namely that the judicial views of the government decisions are by their nature vexatious, sorry, vexatious, and I find it uh, irrational and deeply worrying that a recommendation carrying the weight of the PAC, which has the potential to give rise to very profound consequences for access to justice, should have been drawn from uh, preference for three judicial reviews. Two of these reviews, Caseman Park and the <coughs> A5, found themselves against the department, while the third refers to the A6. Um, he goes on to say, in my opinion, the bulk of the additional 11 million cost of the scheme is a result of this type of specific terms of DFI contracts with contractors and not my judicial review. I understand that the Northern Ireland Audit Office is looking into judicial review practice, which I welcome, and I hope the A6 judicial review challenge. Uh, has any members any comment they wish to make around this? Uh, just to the Chair, uh, and having read his letter, I could totally sort of um, appreciate his comment on uh, the one pejorative word that was actually uh, in it as well too, uh, in terms of uh, judicial reviews and the likes of it. Uh, so I do think that, um, that what he says uh, I really can't find fault with it in the sense of what I still uh, accept entirely as well too, that uh, there is a need um, maybe for the raising of that standards in terms of, uh, of uh, judicial reviews and that here uh, in the north. Mr Beggs. <coughs> um, during our evidence that, that uh, I have heard over the past period, one of the criticisms was that there, were, there was a potential for vexatious um, legal action by unsuccessful firms, so it isn't just around individuals making applications. So um, I think there is a need still needs is a, there still is a need to review um, uh, the use of judicial reviews um, and its effect on costs and the construction industry and public funding. Um, <coughs> it, that's not having any question about uh, any individual applications or for judicial reviews in the past, but certainly in, information did come to us indicating concerns that it was set at different levels here in Northern Ireland than in other places. Um, Mr Donnelly, it, it, um, as my quotation from um, 
the correspondence makes reference to the audit office in terms of the judicial review practice. Uh, are you looking into to this issue? Uh, we are. We've actually commenced work on it, Chair. Um, at this stage, we're entirely open-minded as to what is going to come out of that work. So we're looking at the evidence. So I, I, I don't want to make any comment on it, okay. why, why the work is live. But, uh, you know, in the next... Uh, with that well completed over the next two, three months. Okay. The members, can I put it to the meeting, are you content that we write back to Mr Murphy explaining that the recommendation 13 cannot be uh, recalled as it was agreed by the committee and the report has been led, explaining that the recommendation merely seeks to achieve a balance between having a higher bar for taking judicial review while at the same time not discouraging genuine concerns from being raised. Recommend thir recommendation 13 is a general and is, uh, in general is an application that does not seek to comment on any one judicial review. It does not refer to a specific department and recommends <coughs> action at a higher <coughs> level across the civil service and the judicial system. The, um, are we content with that? Agreed. Sir. Content, agreed. Agreed. Yep. Sorry, uh, just to the chair, uh, that single word, vexatious. Uh, do you have an opinion on that yourself? You were looking at this that uh, that raised concern. The, the, the committee has just taken a position, so I'm not going to make uh, um, uh, my, my opinion on it. We, we we just agreed to the course of action set out. So we'll just leave it at that at this stage. Um, members are referred to the correspondence dated the 3rd of November 2020 from Trevor McKee in pages 20 to 22 of your pack concerning CCNI. Members, are you content to note and forward to the Northern Ireland Audit Office? Great. <coughs> Members are referred to uh, a memo dated the 5th of November 2020 from the Economy Committee and briefing paper, paper dated the 20th of October, pages 23 to 29 of your pack regarding the NIO, NIAO report on generating electricity from renewable energy. The Economy Committee notes that the, it is the Public Accounts Committee's right to primacy in this issue and has now stepped away. Does, any member have any comment to make around this? Okay, well, I think it is disappointing, but it, um, obviously the Public Accounts Committee does have um, primacy around these issues, and I think it's important that other committees um, are, are uh, mindful of that. Um, members, therefore, do you agree that we should write back to the Economy Committee thanking them for their correspondence when reiterating the importance of the primacy of... Uh, this committee to ensure that other committees do not uh, preempt the proceedings which the Public Accounts Committee has a statutory rule. Agreed? Agreed. <coughs> Members, I refer to correspondence from Sir Long, the Chief Executive of the Education Authority, dated the 11th of November, in your table pack, pages 3 through to 6, uh, in response to our letter of the 21st of October 2020. The response includes details of terms of reference for the uh, internal investigation details of the projected budget figures for the statutory assessments and details of the policy of for same pupils who change schools if they then fall to the bottom of the new school statutory assessment list. Has any member any comment they wish to make on that? Okay. Um, members can tend to note. Please. Thank you. Members are referred to correspondence dated the 30th of October 2020 from Chris Murphy. Your pack pages 15 to 19 uh, regarding a report on major capital projects and the 11 million pound spend for the judicial review in the A6 includes a fans. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm to be over. My apologies. I refer to correspondence from Sharon O'Connor, Chair of the EA Board of Governors, dated the 11th of November 2020, in your table pack. So, Connor states that Dr. Andy McMoran, a member of the Education Authority's Board, will also be attending the meeting remotely. She again emphasises that she cannot discuss the internal investigation. All members, uh, also members of Sharon O'Connor and Mr Gavin Boyd will be giving evidence separately. Uh, are you content around those issues? My, my opinion on that is four members respond is um, very similar to the position last week uh, with Mr Brennan and the position today with Ms Maharg. Uh, members are entitled to ask questions. If the chair of the EA and Mr McMoran choose not to ask those questions in public session, then we will move to a position of asking those questions. Indeed, the same will apply to Mr Boyd as the former chief executive. We will then ask those questions in private session. 
members are entitled to ask questions. This is a public body which is funded, funded from the public purse. Members agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Um, members have received correspondence from um, Sue Gray, the accounting officer and permanent secretary of the Department of Finance, dated the 11th of November 2020, in response to our letter of the 26th of October requesting further information. <coughs> Fortunately, this was received late yesterday, and uh, is there's no substantial amount of information in the letter. There is a substantial amount in the letter. I think it's 30 pages long. Yeah. Uh, I have taken the decision that, that we will not have had an opportunity to appraise ourselves of the content of that letter uh, in the time allo uh, allowed from yesterday evening, and therefore uh, we will put it in your pack for next week. Members agree? Great. Great. Okay, members. Um, and we are now about to go into the evidence session for Ms. Mahar in relation to Casement Park. We will begin that evidence session uh, in public and we may then move into a closed session to discuss more sensitive issues. <coughs> uh, members agree? Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, so agenda item six then is the briefing from Tracy Mahar, the accounting officer uh, and permanent secretary of the Department of Finance <coughs> on Casement Park. Uh, in the report of major capital projects. This is in your pack, pages 31 through to 182. At this stage, I'd like to invite Ms. Maharg, the accounting officer from DFC, Jacqueline Ferrin, director of the Regional Stadia Programme and head of capital delivery um, at the Department of Communities to the table. Mr. Donnelly will be in attendance as the Comptroller and Auditor General. Uh, and Mr. Stuart Stevenson, Treasury Officer of Accounts, Department of Finance. And Mr. Kyle Bingham, Assembly Support Officer, will join us remotely. Can I just confirm? I see Mr. Stevenson on the screen. And Mr. Stevenson, ah, Kyle's now joined. Can you both hear and see us okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Ms. Park, how are you? You're very welcome to the committee, Ms. Ferrin. And, and as you will know, uh, we will be open to um, having a presentation from yourselves if you wish to, and then members will ask questions. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, if you don't mind, I think I would like to sort of set out um, a little bit in terms of giving an update on where we are, okay. uh, and also to give some more background just on the specific costs that you spoke about. So. Um, I was here in July, which seems like a lifetime ago now, uh, and then we gave you more information in August and then again in September. And I understand that the committee are looking for more information, particularly on the development costs. Of course, since then, um, there's been some progress in terms of casement. On the 13th of October, uh, the DFI Minister announced she intended to issue a notice of opinion approving the planning application for the casement park project. However, contrary to some of the commentators, the process has not yet, in fact, concluded. Uh, the next step, steps are that Minister Mallon issues the Notice of Opinion approving the planning application, and the Notice of Opinion is issued to Belfast City Council for consideration, and then Belfast City Council have 28 days to consider the Notice of Opinion, and during this time, the details of any conditions which are attached to the Planning Commission are finalised and agreed between the, the appellant and DFI. And only once these steps have been completed can the final decision on the planning application be issued. And we have been advised that this process is not likely to conclude before mid-December. And any conditions attached to the planning commission could have a cost or revenue implication, which would impact the final business case, and this also will have to be assessed. Um, I can tell you that the review of the FPC is ongoing, and CPD is currently carrying out due diligence exercise on project costs. And therefore, you'll, you'll appreciate the interdependencies between the planning process, the full business case, the final cost of the project, all activities that are currently live and ongoing and that need to be concluded. And due to the live and commercially sensitive nature of the project at this stage, you will appreciate there'll be some things that I'll not be in a position to discuss. Um, in particular, this will impact on my ability to answer some questions around current issues of business cases, funding negotiations or estimated costs. Um, however, of course, um, I will actually answer as much as I can specifically in relation to um, the actual following up on, on previous questions. Um, of course, we will be taking these issues to the Communities uh, Committee in due course as these independent work streams continue. Um, turning to the development costs, um, you'll recall that the NI report on major capital projects acknowledges the factors that lead to project delays um, in both the development phase and the construction phase. Um, and I, you'll also recall that Brett Hammond talked about the things that 
make projects um, causes delays and, and problems uh, due to complexity, innovation, imp and their impactful nature. And the one thing that we can predict is that the longer it takes to get a major complex to site, the more it's going to cost. Um, particularly difficult in that is the development phase. That's the, the period before the construction starts. Um, and the PAC uh, report comments on the importance of risk assessment in the early phases of these projects and the benefits of early engagement. And we fully acknowledge this and the importance of investing at the front end to do this the best that we can. But also, I suppose, we also have to acknowledge that there are some risks that are just not foreseeable. And, for example, the current um, COVID-19 pandemic is a clear example of a risk that we couldn't have foreseen. Um, the development phase of a project is the part of the project from outline business case stage through full business case, including the development of the design, consultation, window for legal challenge, planning application and assessment period. Um, the breakdown of the what was 10.5 million costs when we gave it to you, submitted to the PAC, is a summary of costs relating to this development phase. Development costs for any construction project in the public sector are capitalised in line with the counting standards and indeed in the private sector too. This allows for all costs directly attributable to bringing the asset into working condition to be capitalised. Um, at the hearing on July, I outlined how the regional study programme was set up. The governance arrangements for the three uh, projects, each has the same governance, the same suite of documents, filling out the school scope, roles and responsibilities, and the assessment and release of grant, exactly the same. The scale, of course, of the costs differ, reflecting the, the, the complexity of the projects along with the timescales in which they're delivered. However, the specific items of expenditure eligible for grant funding in the development phase outlining the, the breakdown, the provider for casement, are slim, similar across all projects. And as I said, the longer it takes to get to site, the, the higher the potential costs will be. Um, and in, in casement, as you've seen the last time, um, the prolongation included a JR, associated legal costs, a second planning application, additional surveys, uh, additional costs to project-related roles. Um, so in terms of the time-related costs included within the breakdown, you'll see that one of the substantial elements in that is related as salaries. It's important to define what we mean by salaries in this regard. The term salaries relates specifically to the project-related roles identified as essential for the delivery of the project, engaged solely for the purpose of delivering the project and only for the lifespan of the project. It is fundamental to the success of any project that the most appropriate people with the required professional expertise and relevant project experience are responsible for the delivery of the project. And indeed, this has been highlighted in your PAC report. Um, in DFC, we generally fund construction costs uh, via capital grant allocation, which means that unlike, for example, the Department for Infrastructure, we don't deliver projects directly ourselves. Um, that means the project is effectively delivered by the third party, and that was in the case in the three um, Stadia projects. Each governing body was charged with delivering each project. In line with the MOU and funding arrangements, each Stadia had project-specific roles identified as being required to deliver the project and the number of personnel employed was proportionate with the size, complexity and values. <coughs> Roles funded included project SRO, project sponsor, independent technical advisor and financial or administrative costs. I'm happy to go into more detail of those in, in any questions that you has, ask. Um, the roles obviously identified um, cover the period um, 2011 um, to 2019. As I said, in the other two study projects, similar roles were funded, albeit for a shorter period of time. Um, also, um, in planning for this, just wanted to make sure that, these, that there was a consistency in what we were doing in other projects, and we understand there is. Also, the scale and size is similar to other, other projects. Um, and you will appreciate if we don't have the right people in project delivery roles, uh, we're putting a project delivery at risk. Um, I suppose just to ensure you that the approval and release of grant for these costs are in line with what was intended. We have a robust payment approval and vouching system, and this has been reviewed by the, our internal audit uh, most recent in 2019. And I also understand it was reviewed um, by um, a staff member of NIAO. So finally, <laughs> I'm sorry that was a bit longer, but I thought it was important to get those things uh, out. In conclusion, um, 
the, it is regrettable that um, the development costs have increased as they have, um, but I can assure you that the 10.5 million was expended in line with accepted guidelines designed for the regional stadium programme and in accordance with the other two projects. Uh, the capitalised items are in line with costs capitalised in the other two projects, and the costs expended and the process for expenditure have been subject to robust governance and audit procedures. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Turn, is there anything you wish to add? Nothing at this stage. I'm happy to take okay, calls. OK. Thank you. Mr Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. Uh, and you're very welcome this afternoon, ladies. And thank you for your presentation. You've given quite a bit of detail there as it is. So. Um, on the historic cost to date, then, obviously the figure of 10.5 million has been knocking about for some time now, and obviously you gave a list there of potentially what all that was spent on, but that 10 million has been repetitive now for a number of years nearly. How confident are you that that is accurate, the 10.5 million? So because to the right person, it does appear that the expenditure has been ongoing. Okay. So in terms of the development costs, um, I can assure you that 10.5 million was the figure, the right figure when we gave it to you. Uh, at the moment, that figure is more like 10.6 million. Um, and of course, um, that figure will continue to move. If you take, if you look at what they, it makes up, for example, um, the salary costs, you know, salary costs will continue the lifetime of the project. So there's nine years of salary costs in that. Um, some of the, the, the costs were more upfront costs. Um, some will continue, as I say, and in there, for example, the design, you'll see that it costs, you know, almost, if you look at the, 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 the breakdown we gave you in terms of the design, um, that, that in phase one, at the 1. Um, 4, 1. Well, nearly 1.5 million, and then there was, uh, you know, there was the, sorry, the IST contract, there was another 531 for the next X phase, so you'll see that, um, the, the, the fees actually for the ICT were, have, have more than doubled. You'll see they went from 2.6 to 2.8. But I can assure you that we monitor these figures very carefully. These figures are agreed in an, on an annual basis with the, the programme. They are included in a letter of offer. With, there's been six letters of offers purely on the development costs. Uh, they are monitored very carefully, as I said. They have been reviewed in detail, most recent in 2019 by internal audit. So I'm very comfortable that the costs that we're giving you are the correct costs at any moment in time that we're giving them to you. Um, historically, also, then, the, that figure of 10.5 or 10.6 million is maybe now. It is that divided out as per the agreement, the funding split? Is that, you know, was it... 80 20, so is 8 million of that departmental, and has the GA then paid 2 million at this stage, or what way does that pan out? Just so, um, at, uh, on top of the 10.5, the GA have spent about uh, half a million um, on, on these types of activities, so it hasn't been done on a, on a 20 uh, 80 split. That basically, what will happen is those project costs will be capitalised into the full project costs. So the 28 split will be done on the basis of the absolute costs. So these, these costs will be, be part of the total costs. So at the moment, the most recent figure we have in the costs, is, as I gave you the last time, was 112. So as part of that 112, there'd be the, the you know, there's the split. Yeah. There's the split uh, and on 112, how confident are you on that one? Because I've spoken to many people within sort of construction and they don't see the final plans. And what. It seems it's a bit on the low side at this stage even to contemplate 112, considering what the desires are to put in place what they want. So, um, I'm sorry, the last time you did ask me about visuals, so I have brought some of you interested in them. I'll just leave them for you here. I've printed them out. Um, um, 112 was an estimate at a moment in time. Time equals money. So, you, you know, if we were, there's no doubt that the final costs will not be 112. Um, we can't actually get a final cost until such time as we have clarity of when, you know, the planning mission is finalised because, you know, there, there, there's obviously a, a spectrum of, of things that could impact the timing before construction happens. Um, so the 112 was the estimate I can't even, when was the 112 estimated? What's the date for that? It's live until November 2019. 
So that was the last year down the line now from that. Yeah. So. so construction costs alone, if you think, I think between 2014 and 2019, went up 50 Between 2013 cents. and 2019, 2021, they estimated construction inflation is 56 per cent. And if we've also got COVID-19 <coughs> to take account of now, so um, so it's uncertain. So Can I can't stand over 100. Would you have at this stage? Based no, I would be completely irresponsible. Of, no, well, 56 percent is, is included in, in that 112 because that was the period of which we were looking at it. So... Um, it's I would add that the CPD are actually assisting the GAA in their due diligence of the cost um, between 20 November 19 and now, so that's part of the ongoing exercise that will feed into the final FBC. But th this sort of uncertainty over the cost, then, is that not going to place the likes of the GAA in a very difficult position? Because obviously, on the 80 20 split, I know if I was in charge of an organisation, <laughs> been sitting wondering what the final figure is going to be and where would I get that from? Is, is how confident are you that we're going to actually? Because of course the minister came out and obviously indicated her full support for the project as, as she would do, and there didn't seem to be any additional cost. The GA, but then that changed within a week or two, where then it became clear that the GA were going to be responsible for additional cost. So you can see how that's going to leave the GA surely in a very difficult position moving forward. Such a big, big project as to how they're going to financially contribute and haven't previously said they weren't going to do it. So we haven't completed negotiations with the GA yet on that, um, but I think you know we all recognise that the, the increase in cost is, is, is challenging, um, but um, ultimately this is, this is a commitment um, to, to deliver this project. So um, that, that will be when the Minister gets the full costs and the negotiations are done, obviously she'll have to come back to the Executive. And then on the the bit that was a bugbear for me during the whole capital <coughs> projects investigation, the optimum bias, uh, I think it was some of the projects were running towards 10 per cent. Would that be similar with the basement project? Because in my mind, the 10 per cent, the optimum bias, running at that sort of level is just a, a, another hidden spending pot to be used by contractors as and when required. And, I've seen fallouts between clients and contractors in the past when I've been involved in project teams and it can become quite, quite nasty. It is a really difficult one, Optimus Bias, and I think we acknowledged that the last time around, that you know, if you put it too high, it looks like you're inflating the project. If you don't put it high enough, it looks like you're not anticipating risks. Because this one here will be 10 million plus Optimus Bias. Um, well, I, I can take that one. Want, yep. Yeah, I can take that. Yeah, we, you're right. We did discuss optimal bias a lot of the, of the last time, and we described how, at the start, the earlier stages of the business case, for example, OBC and, and SOC, that it should be higher. And you're right; it should come down as the risks become known, because optimism bias is there to um, to, to, to cover the risk profile of the of the project. Um, the optimism bias needs to be looked at again for this. It will be looked at again prior to completion of the final business case. Um, but the more risks that can be anticipated in advance of that, the better. For example, if you were to do optimum bias at the moment, you'd have to um, allow for the risk of planning, JR, etc. But if you, if, as those risks fall away, then your optimism bias should fall down. But you're right, the optimism bias will be looked again. And, and you don't look at saying it should be 10%. There are actual industry calculators when you feed in all the risks to come up with a number. And, um, and CPD and Deloitte will be, will be looking at that on behalf of the department. Uh, we'll also be looking at um, some other tools to look at risk and optimism bias at that stage. And we're looking at cost and construction risk registers, which... Uh, the Department for Education use uh, a lot when they're looking at the costing the risks. But I suppose the thing about optimism bias is that I think there's a misconception that it's seen as a fund to be had on top of any project, and if it's managed properly, it shouldn't be. Uh, there's proper mechanisms to apply for optimism bias uh, through the department, and it has to be uh, vouched by the economists in the department. So it's not a pot um, just to be used on top of the the budget when it's allocated, yeah. it should be. There just seems to be a difference between the private sector and the public sector as far as the usage of the well, fund is. Well, I have worked in the public Britain sector as well, and you know, when, you, when you're working in, the, you'd probably call it contingency in the public sector uh, as such, and you'd value your risks and you'd put a value, you put a value on them. But the idea is to mitigate against those and to do whatever you can during the life cycle of the project to reduce those risks, and hence the need to um, extract funds out of a contingency pot 
reduces as you go along, but it is certainly part of good project management, but it is vouched by the economists in the department as we go along. Um, and yes, we will be uh, calculating again prior to the finalisation of the FBC. Uh, just the other area I had interest in was obviously the safety element of the project. And, and what, what, what's the capacity currently? 34,500. I couldn't say the exact number. That, that has been reduced from? 38,000 in 38. the first. Um, the, the initial, I think actually the initial uh, was going to be 40,000. Then the design, that, the design that went for planned permission was 38,000. And this most recent one is the 30, just of 34,000 plus. So, the back of that, I'd be certainly looking confidence in the, the 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 team behind the scenes who will be leading that sort of safety element of things because previously, obviously, that's where a lot of the difficulties lay. Uh, obviously, with the in-house team that Sport and I and the department had at that time, we were very very of a high level expertise. Then another group came in from England who basically. Told us it was all singing, all dancing at that stage, and it really wasn't. Their, their arguments were blown out of the water, but I'm sure they went back across the water again with quite a few pounds in their pocket, having come over and given a few. So, how will that all? Be, how will the whole safety element of it? Be? Because that is where the difficulties arose the last time. Yeah, and I think at the last time I spoke about the 2015 PAR and, and, and had the importance of that. Um, that, that brought over the, the right level of expertise to actually give us an assessment. And it focused a lot on STG. Um, and I'm very confident that actually moving forward in 2015, particularly um, the, the input um, from the um, SG safety grounds. Yeah, I was getting SGSA um, in, in there. Yeah. And the final design was signed off by um, Buff City Council. Um, the, the blue light services, um, and indeed, you know, it's deemed as best practice. So I think there's a, a lot of learning in the process that has gone into this project. And again, you know, well, I do understand that the, Belf the Belfast City sort of blue light group and haven't even been meeting for some considerable time. The well, so have they been looking at it from a localised point of view? Or? Well, it's certainly the design was signed off by. The blue light services when it went into planning, as as you know, so that, I mean, obviously, because it's not surprising given the focus of the CAL committee, given the focus of the PAR, given the focus of the JR, that actually safety was seen as an absolute key element on the project moving forward from 2015, and I think that has been one of the big learnings actually from the, that period, and I and I do believe, I mean, Northern Ireland at that stage hadn't delivered a stadium of that scale before. So I do think there is there has been a lot of learning and acceptance of of the, what we need to do in these types of projects. But as far as the capital projects report goes, it's been very very costly. So. Yes. Thank you. At this okay, stage. Thank you, right. Mr. O'Toole. Thank you, um, Chair. Just on the um, <clears throat> question of the negotiations with the GAA, <clears throat> not split. Um, the eighty twenty. It, is that what is the basis of that? Is that um, contractual or that's in the original contract? Yeah. So uh, the eighty twenty split is built into the, the uh, a funding uh, agreement. Um, which, so basically, there was an MOU, there was a funding agreement, um, which sort of set the parameters for each of the projects, and that's built into that. So the, the current agreement is as per the current agreement. Current agreement is as per the current agreement. That that, that was obviously that's the fifteen million pounds uh, by GAA. And that's predicated on the original figure of 77 million. That's correct. Um, and so obviously this is a live discussion, but your position of the department is that you want the DAA to pay 20% of 112 of the current, or whatever the end point is, but the, the end capitalised cost will be 112 is the current estimate. The best current is 112. The minister didn't specifically. She, 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 her most recent statement you'd have heard is she did. She, she said that the GAA need to increase their contribution. So it's not that 20 percent of 112 is 20, just over 22 and a half million. So the position of the department is not that the GAA have to pay 22 and a half million. It's that they should pay a bit more. So well, we haven't. We you appreciate. You we know, obviously, we haven't ended negotiations yet. And I certainly, you know, if I'm going to negotiate, <laughs> if we're going to negotiate, then we need to have some room to negotiate. And that's why I'd rather not kind of get into, how, you know, how how we'll, we'll negotiate. But I would say that 
it's difficult to start that conversation until we have the final costs, and that's where, why these things are also interdependent. Um, because obviously, until the planning, um, we have clarity on when planning is going to be finalised and next steps, then we can't finalise the costs. And until we finalise the cost, it's hard to go back to the executive, you know, no, no, for the finalised negotiations with GAA, go back to the executive on all the things that need to be done. So there are, is there a live discussion at the minute with the GAA, or are you waiting for? We, we are, we are in live, we are in live discussions with the GAA at the moment around the whole project, all aspects of the project. But is your anticipation that you will get a new number from them, or you will get an intention to, uh, you will get an agreement to move higher in principle? So I, I can only really get, say back to you what is in the public domain on that point, which is the most recent, um, you know, the, my, my minister's most recent statement. Okay. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mr. Beggs. Uh, actually, it's in the same subject here. You, you said there, the agreement was an 80 20 split. But in a letter to yourselves dated the 24th of August that you have forwarded to us as to how the current uh, expenditure has occurred, you've indicated that there's ring fenced executive expenditure of 10.5 million and only 400,000. Uh, GAA ex expenditure, so it's less than 5%. So if it's an 80-20 split, uh, split, why is only 5% being paid by the GAA, even though about 15% of that is of salaries to the GAA? Um, the, obviously, you okay? Yeah. You, you no, no, you go yeah. ahead. No, um, a couple of things to clarify there. The 80-20 the split and the split for the similar project in the IFA had a, a contribution as well. It was the actual figures that were in the funding agreement that happened to pertain to the percentage that it was, so it doesn't actually say that uh, there's an 80-20 split, it just happens to work out like that. However, the way these projects Sorry, can you clarify? I don't understand what you said. Well, what I'm saying is that in each of the funding agreements, the financial contribution was laid out. The Kingspan Stadium, it was zero because of a, a previous commitment on a, a project that had just completed. On the uh, on the Windsor Park Stadium, it was four million, and on the Kingspan Park Stadium, it was fifteen million. And it was the actual figure that was put in to the funding agreement, um, not pertaining to uh, a figure that goes forward in the future. So that that's something that we have to work on. But if we use the the con contract that's completed, for example, in the Windsor Park Stadium, the way the funding agreement was set up right back from it was set up in 2012. The, the percentage that was paid by the um, governing body was paid at the back end of the project. So the agreement was that all of the initial funding would come from the department and the um, partnership funding would kick in at the back end. So if we use the IFA, for example, their four million was paid at the very end of the project. That was also the anticipation going into the Casewin Park project that the 15 million funding would come in at the back end. However, in 2017, um, when the project was going through its second phase, um, the department asked the uh, GAA, um, by virtue of um, good partnership, could they start to contribute to the project? And they did. Uh, they started contributing at that point 10% of the, each of the annual letters of offer. So it wasn't that it was meant to be 80-20 along the project. It was always going to be set up at the back end, and that's something that we would like to look at in the, in the funding agreement as we go forward. It's also up for, for grabs as we go forward. So it was never, we've never gone in any of the projects pro rata on an annual basis. And can you um, give a further, a further detailed explanation of the funding that you're paying in terms of GAA salaries? Yes. What, what's the, what are they, what's it actually pay, paying for? What's the public first paying for there? Okay, so basically it's the, um, the we're paying for the SRO. Um, we're paying for the um, project sponsor. We're paying for legal costs. We're paying finance costs, admin costs, and we're paying for the independent technical uh, assessor. So, uh, and so th those are the those are the, the key costs. So, um, the SRO, um, then the GAA would wouldn't be a full time post. The project sponsor would. The ITA is. Um, we've got the we've got further breakdowns on those costs. If if you if you if you're yeah. in, in in many um, capital projects, community groups, uh, and I, I think even I believe the the the, uh, the soccer and the, the rugby stadium had a figure, and they had to live within that means. And so, in many development projects, come near the final stage, 
if they if they've been on additional on expected costs, people start to have to uh, look at where refinement and design can occur to live within the budget. Why has there been nothing of that in this project? Well, the I suppose in the, the original OBC set out what the aspirations of the project were, which is a stadium which would host. Um, you know, large-scale you know, events that were presently been happening um, largely at, outside Northern Ireland. Um, and also the original options looked at a range of other ones, and this was the option that was deemed uh, the most efficient and effective option. Um, and therefore, if we deliver the objective set out in the OBC, then this is the, this is the project that delivers that. I don't know if you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um... <coughs> I'm, I'm hearing a wee bit maybe about value engineering as the project goes forward, and you'd, you would be right in any construction project before you would um, probably into the, before you start the construction on site, you would carry out what's called a value engineering exercise, and that has that was happened on the previous two projects, and that actually did happen with the current IST, the current main contractor, before they were due to start this construction phase. So it is a standard. Um, practice that would happen and a value engineering exercise did happen the last time and it will happen this time as well. So basically what it is, you take the final construction, you take the final cost and you carry out a suite of workshops to see where savings can be made and where that can be brought into the project. So that will be happened before the construction starts on site and that's in the construction phase. But will that be based on the 110 million or 112 million or that the 77 based, million? That will be based on the final contract, or whatever that final contract sum comes in at. If the public has been expected to pay an additional 80% of the additional, uh, what's that, £43 million, um, pounds, what other projects are, are being missed out? Because that is public money that will not be able to be used for other projects. What other community projects will be missing out? I suppose ultimately that will be, a, you know, capital prioritisation is something that in the department that, you know, we obviously have to look at all the time. Um, and obviously... It's, it's not just within our department, it'll be you know, in, in the wider public sector. So it's something the executive will have to consider when they look at the total costs of the project. Um, ultimately, they, you know, the executive have made a commitment to this project. So um, the, the costs of the project are what they are. But, but there's no commitment in the breakdown of the final cost. Is that what you're saying as of yet? I'm sorry? You're saying that the, 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 the split... It is not necessarily the 80-20 split that has originally been agreed? We haven't completed or concluded negotiations with the GA, is correct. Do you see that increasing or decreasing? But I mean, I'm obviously, I, I've said I'm really very, very reluctant to comment on that. I'm not being disrespectful, but you can appreciate that. Uh, I, I do, you know, I can't. I can't. £42 million, pounds, how many social houses would that build? Um, <clears throat> Well, I know that the, the Minister is very, very keen to also increase the build of social houses. Um, but you have to choose where you spend your money, so how many houses I do appreciate that, but hopefully it doesn't have to be between social houses and Casement Park. But I'm, I'm asking the question. Well, obviously, you know, that won't be my choice. Um, we, we, have, we will be bidding for money to increase social housing. How much well. does it cost to build a social house, typically? Oh, how much is a social house? I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. I can tell you that our budget, but what our budget for the year is, which... Um, this year it's just under two, 200 million um, to about 170 million and we're doing about um, uh, I don't know, 1,800 homes so I, I haven't can't work that in my head. But you appreciate there are choices, there are opportunity choices when you spend money in projects? I, 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 do, I, totally, I, do, I totally appreciate that and it's something that we as you know we because of the size of this department we have to deal with all the time because we have so many different requests for money, when, whether it's arts or culture or houses. or So it's something that we are spending a lot more time on in terms of building up our own expertise so that we can give the right, the right advice to our minister in terms of what the social and economic benefits of, the, of our capital spend is. And, and, and given the escalating costs, including to meet the health and safety requirements, that has been uh, uh, one of the factors I've moved out as added costs to this project. Uh, at any stage, was there any consideration at looking at the scale of the project so that you could live within your means? Um, the, the scale of the project has decreased. Um, as I said, it went down from 38,000 to 34,000. However, any further reduction in the scale of the project effectively means it doesn't meet the purpose of which the original 
objective for the project was, which is that this is this a stadium that could host the scale um, of games. So you're saying you never considered that always additional <clears throat> public money was being added. That's that. that it, you know, we we we've been asked through the GAA to, to deliver a project which has a specific purpose, which is to host those those games, and and that that's what. We are I, I could understand that they were paying one hundred percent of the additional money, but that isn't isn't what you seem to be saying. So is it, is it not reasonable that the public money that was committed should have been the ceiling? Um, well, obviously the the time frame for this project in itself, never mind the design, would always have meant this project was going to increase in costs. And the, the ultimate question is: Is this still a project which is worthy of the investment, and that the executive feel that it's they want to invest in, and certainly it was again committed to in the NDNA. So I can only refer to it as being an executive commitment, <coughs> and that's and, and that's that's it, that's it, that's the choice that that will need to be made. Has there ever been any discussions within um, your department, or for that matter, you're aware of at a higher level uh, about um, NDNA not being affordable because it hasn't been funded? Well, obviously. The commitments are under NDNA are ministerial commitments, and obviously I know I work under the direction and control of my minister. And if my minister tells me that she wants a commitment to do something, it is up to me and my team to attempt to deliver that. Thank you. I just remind members that um, Ms. Mahar does not make the policy, political policy of the department. That's a matter of politicians, and that in fact applies to all accounting officers that appear in front of this committee. I understand the point you were making, but we just need to bear that in mind. Um, Ms Flynn. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks very much, Tracy. Um, so just to bring it back to the, the timeline of the planning approval. Um, so you had um, spoke about the um, issue and the notice of opinion, and then the Belfast City Council have that period of 28 days. Um, and then there's a number of things then that there's a process that needs to take place there. Um, and I think the hope is that it will conclude before mid-December. And my question is really, because obviously you had reference, so the longer all of this takes to um, get to the point of the on-site construction, then the higher the costs are, are the 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 uh, the costs are going to continue to rise. <clears throat> so with that process, that the planning application still has to go through. Um, does the department foresee any issues with that process, or should that be pretty straightforward? That the um, notice of opinion, the Belfast City Council, or is there any possibilities that you are looking at or planning for in case that um, in case that process is then dragged out? Um, you know, is <coughs> mid December realistic? Because I'm just <coughs> conscious with some of the points that were made by other members as well. So if the the negotiations with the GAA um, really can't kick off properly until that planning has completely been sealed and signed off. Um, you would just be worried that there is a cost to it all. So should that be straightforward or um, would there be any delays? That's my first question, please. Okay, so um, we're hoping to say that the, the planning um, comes through um, the end of December. Um, obviously, Following the planning, the last time round there was a JR 89 days into the planning. Um, so um, obviously, when we are looking at the um, various scenarios in terms of timeframes, we're having to look at what the further potential risks that could befall the project. Um, so clearly, when the actual project comes on the ground, very much depends on. For, for example, whether there's a further JR, um, um, and if there is a JR, if it's successful or not, um, how long that takes to work through to conclusion. Um, so there's a, there is, you know, there are a number of issues that still we won't know until such time as that 90 days is completed. Okay, thank you. And I know I had referenced the last time that um, we had spoke that um, obviously I represent West, the community of West Belfast and. Um, so um, um, you know, um, conscious of all the issues that were faced and concerns at local residents, um, 
some of the, the issues that they had and that some of the local residents, indeed some of them, still do have. But um, there has been a lot of work that's been done with engaging with the local community. And, um, you know, I can say from the people that, that I represent and that I've spoke to after the announcement um, from the Minister recently that, you know, West Belfast is awaiting in suspense on this um, major project. So um, hopefully things things do run smoothly from here on in. Um, I know that the bringing it back to the, the GAA and that 80-20 split and, and that all that um, can't be worked out properly until the planning's complete. But uh, how often, Tracy, would your department be in contact with the GAA or indeed the minister? So is that an ongoing conversation? So once you get to the point of hopefully December time, um, you know that you're in right away and you're able basically to, to get down to business without dragging anything out further. Yeah, I know. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I should say at this stage that there is an absolute commitment on behalf of uh, the department to work closely with the GA to ensure that once planning is through, there is, a, you know, really, you know, lots, lots more consultation and we couldn't agree more about the need to make sure that we stay close um, uh, to, to, to the community. Um, we have both formal and informal meetings with the GAA. Um, Probably, Jacqueline, you're probably best to sort of give the data. I can say from my own perspective, I, there's a weekly update to myself and the minister. Um, and then I have a, at least a monthly discussion with the SRO on where the project is. Um, I, there was a meeting, I think this week we had the most recent meeting with you. Do you want to just yeah. give a detail on how often yeah, we, I mean, we speak with the GAA? It's a really intense period and there's a timeline there and a critical path. And from a project management perspective, my biggest goal at the moment is to keep the project on that critical path. To do that, I host a weekly meeting with the GAA, um, both to hold to account and to assist, because we're trying to do this in partnership. Um, so we meet with the GAA weekly as a project team. The Minister meets with the GAA board every three weeks, and I join that meeting. The Minister weeks with the, meets with the Stadia programme team every two weeks. Our board, the Stadia programme board, meets every four weeks, um, and I probably speak to someone in the GAA every other day. There's an awful lot of engagement at the moment. I know as SRO, Maura Doherty, the SRO, has regular meetings, albeit virtually. All of our meetings are virtual, obviously, at the moment, with the project SRO, Tom Daly. Um, yeah, and then we brief. We do a physical briefing to the minister every week, a highlight report, we call them, um, and I am in constant contact with Tracy as well. So we're, we're in a very critical phase, and it's right that we should have this level of contact at this time in the project. And sure, just one final um, small point, please. Just regarding the, it's been mentioned around the COVID um, pandemic, and I'm just wondering, has is the department, um, has the department put any sort of cont contingency plans in place? So if things do get moving um, over the <clears throat> the next couple of months, um, will the the COVID nineteen will that have an impact on the timeline for getting things on site for construction, or are you trying? to sort of put plans in place, even at this, this stage? So, the, be honest with you, the, 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 it's unlikely there'll be cons any, any construction on the site before um, the far end of next year. And we're all, we're all, I think everybody here hopes by the far end of next year that um, with the vaccine and stuff, that, that, that COVID-19 will not be such a big impact. But there will be residual impacts from COVID-19 in terms of construction costs, potentially. There's a couple, I mean, I think the industry as a whole is still in flux over COVID-19. I know the biggest impact that it has had is on the um, delivery speed of projects. If you can imagine, sites can't be as fully occupied, so construction programme slows down. Um, at the moment, uh, because we're not, uh, we have to still make the decision on whether to re-procure with the IST or remain with the current IST, so we're not in full negotiations on that type of detail with the contractor. but. I know that CPD are doing a lot of work, a lot of industry engagement around the construction industry in COVID-19, um, and, uh, and we speak to CPD regularly about that. So we will be doing everything that CPD advise um, at the time. But as Tracy said, we're hoping that we'll be in a very different place by the time the project gets to site. And by the time it does, I think the industry will have adapted better, and we'll certainly be able to replicate what's happening um, under the advice of CPD at the time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, can I just ask... How long has this Casement Park project been in the pipeline or being discussed? Long. Um, well, I suppose 2009 is probably when the decision was taken. Um, 
this, was it Gregory Campbell took the decision in 2009 that we weren't going to do a single multi stadium. Um, and that's whenever the three sporting codes were asked to bring um, forward proposals. Um, so um, 2009 was would have been when the the three the decision was taken. The, 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 the three separate yeah. stadiums. Yeah, I just make that point because the number of occasions you've invoked the NDNA agreement, that agreement happened in January of this year. That's correct. Need to just keep that yeah. in perspective. Um, in terms of the planning in December, the potential of a, a uh, potential judicial review, can I ask, has the department or the GAA or people on their behalf been talking to the local residents? I think Mora, is that the name of the residents organisation? Have there been conversations with them? Well, certainly I, I know that the plan is to be, have significant conversations once planning has come through and there has been conversation. I'm not certain whether they're having conversation at the moment. Jacqueline, can you I don't tell know me? if they're speaking directly to the group. There's a few groups. There's ARC, yeah, ARC there's as well, um, Anderson Family Generation. Um, yeah, there's two. So my my recollection, and, and David and I are, Mr Hillage and I are veterans of this, having been in the, the, the DECAL committee. Two groups, one which is broadly supportive yeah. and I'm the other concerned about the size of the yeah. stadium. It does give me cause for concern, I have to say, when we're, we've spent £10.5 million pounds, that we're talking about, we're not really sure whether those conversations are being had. You know, um, those people were very vocal and very vociferous uh, and very opposed, not to a stadium, but to the scale of the stadium. And I, I don't think it's sensible approach that those people are not being, t um, if there haven't been meetings, I think that's the right approach. Certainly, we can certainly come back to you and let you know whether there has been any recent, recent if, meetings. If you, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Um, Sven, you, you said that the SRO um, is in regular contact with the GAA. Who is the SRO? I missed the name. Yes, Ma Maura yeah. Doherty. Okay, um, and how often would she be in touch with them? I'd have to speak to Maura, but certainly um, once a month formally through the programme boards and informally, I'd say, every couple of weeks. Every couple of weeks? Okay. Um, so, Harg, you said the purpose of the stadium was, was um, in terms of um, larger games or whatever. Was it, was it not a dual purpose? Was it, was it not a situation where there would be larger games potentially, but also concerts held at this venue? Yes, the, um, the, the, the res there is, but it's, it's just that's part of the sort of the commercial operation of it as well. I'm not sure in the planning how many. Planning application was for three a year. Three a year, so it's quite a you know it's not a major part of it. Okay. Good. I mean, ten point five million pounds of public money has been spent to date. Um, what has been the benefit of the public purse from that ten point five million pounds? Well, the ultimately the ten point five will be capitalised into the project, and that's when the benefits will flow. Um, and we're still confident that this project can have significant economic and social benefits in the area. Clearly, if the project doesn't take place, which we all hope this does not happen, uh, you know we're still very you know confident that this 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 can deliver the benefits. But you know, there 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 is cases where people have invested in development costs at the front end and projects haven't delivered. So it'd be wrong for me to suggest that development costs um, are always you know capitalised into the project because I know that when we were looking at you know the um, the prolongation of projects and the impact on costs. We, we saw in some places, particularly around stadiums, I think actually Brett Hammond brought some evidence around very large stadium projects, which actually um, they were decided not to move forward with because they had the inflation had gotten mm. so so um, high. Yeah, but as we sit now today, the benefit to the public purse and to, and to Northern Ireland PLC from this ten point five million pounds is what? It's we have drawings. We're about to have planning permission for a major stadium in um, in West Belfast, and we're hoping to deliver the ambition for that stadium. That's where it's got us to. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, ten point five million pounds in public purse, and 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 you know, I think people out there will be understandably perplexed at that. Um, in terms of the um, negotiations that uh, the department is having with the GA. I mean, is the, is, the, is the department convinced that the GA will move its Ulster finals uh, from, I think they're playing in Clonus, 
I'm not an expert, but I think they're playing Clonus in Northern Ireland. Um, um, I, I probably there's people in the room that are more experts on the GAA than, than me that can oh, undoubtedly answer, answer those, you're, you're, you're the person those, has to answer the questions. Those questions better me. My understanding is yes, that that is what they want to do. Um, and indeed, you know, I, I, I have been down to Clonus and, and seen the, um, you know, the condition of the stadium there, and it is in very sore need of yeah. um, a, a better, a better um, stadium. But have they given you a commitment? Can I take that, Tracy. Yes, go yeah. ahead. Um, in the business case assessment, um, we had a, a session in the department when the business case came in, and these were the type of issues that we raised with the GA at the time. Um, for us to achieve the benefits, as Tracy's outlined, we needed commitment that there were going to be a certain number of maximum capacity games per year that would generate as much revenue as that. The GA have guaranteed that they will put into their business case um, the recommendations that the department make around, I think there's quarterfinals and semifinals also get a certain capacity, so they're willing to, to look at the capacity games and build them into the offering to the department. So they have given commitments to the department? They will be in the final business case, which is still at in this draft. this stage they haven't? Oh, at this stage they have, verbally, but, you know, we're, it's, and it's in the draft, but a draft is draft until it's complete, but they have certainly right. given their commitments. That that, the, that's their indication. Exactly the point I was going to make, the draft is a draft until it's put in writing. Absolutely, but we, we, in the spirit of partnership, we have to believe that they will deliver in that final draft what we've asked them to do in yeah. the negotiations. Yeah, I appreciate that, and I'm not being pedantic here, but we're ten and a half million pounds of the public's purse further down the line, eleven years, and we need to be getting beyond, you know, verbal commitments. But the business case doesn't stack up unless we have that commitment, so it has to yeah. be there. Yeah. Some of us have been saying that for some time. In terms of the the blue light. Um, at Belfast City Council, in terms of roads, in terms of safety, in terms of traffic concerns, are you saying they've, that's been signed off and agreed now? Am I saying sorry? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, has that been agreed in terms of the, you know, the police, uh, the fire brigade, the ambulance service, Belfast City Council, uh, who ultimately are the people who will sign off and give the certification for the stadium, in terms of the roads infrastructure around, in terms of health and safety, in terms of traffic management, Pedestrian access and egress, have that, has that all been agreed and signed off? My understanding is that the uh, that was all signed off by the STG in advance of the um, the project going to planning. Right. So, yes, the answer is yes. The council has signed it off, okay. Um, and, and finally then, we we'll bring other members in. Um, Mr Frank, can I just ask, you're the director of regional stadium, uh, the regional stadium pro programme, so what, have you been involved in... Uh, Ravenhill and Windsor Park and now this. I came in in 2015 which was at the tail end of the Windsor Park Stadium. Okay. Um, could I ask, have you an involvement or have you a role in the sub-regional stadium? I, I don't. That there is a there is a pro programme manager currently in the department for the uh, sub-regional stadium. who's that? I'm not personally involved at the moment. That's a, a girl called Shirley Ch Chambers but the grade five in the department, the, the director of active communities uh, and sport, that's Catherine Hill. She's currently looking after the, uh, the sub-regional programme. Okay. Could, could we, I know we're saying slightly, slightly straying off what we're here to talk about, but it is all connected. Mm -hmm. um, could we have a, 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 something from the department in terms of uh, how, those, how that work is progressing uh, and monies that projected, monies that are set aside for the sub-regional stadia going forward? Okay, so um, a lot of work has, so, so basically sub-regional, as, you, as you'll be aware, sort of sat for quite some time. Um, I, I'd started, before we got the executive back, to actually um, start going out and talking um, to all the interested parties. Um, and the minister has continued with that, and we now have a, a regional a steady stakeholder group that are really trying to update and, and get input into the way forward. Um, I do think that um, you know your recommendation around that front end engagement um, is, is something that we are very active active in here. But to be frank with you, I, I can't give you any update on amounts. Um, you know the the amount hasn't 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 moved. Okay. Could, could I ask you, if you don't mind, who are the people who are, who populate the sub regional studio? Uh, working group. Oh, I've got it in here somewhere. Um, they've been working. I know they've been working with councils. They've been working with clubs. I, I'll send it to you if you don't mind. I just can't no, no, find fine. it in my in my. Um, okay. 
I, what I can do is I can send you a list of all of the, they, they've also done a survey uh, amongst all the clubs. So that uh, I do have some, something here given. I'll, 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 I'll give you an update you. on that. Okay, thanks. Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Most of my questions have been dealt with by other members, but just um, one issue. Um, the risk of judicial review um, hangs large in relation to this, and obviously there's been experience of that previously. I just wanted to get an assurance that um, all has been done that can be done to mitigate against that risk, and if a judicial review does materialise, whether the salary is payable, uh, will continue to have to uh, be a cost attributable to the project. So, obviously, the the, the you know the fact that there has been a JR was a huge informed greatly the work that was done um, to come to the the new design. So that took account of um, obviously some of the traffic management issues, the safety concerns of the CAL, um, and the the recommendations on the PAR. So. There was a lot of front-end work done on that um, planning application to address the um, the issues that had come through the previous JR. So there is nothing further that we can do now uh, in terms of uh, whether a JR, a further JR, happens or not. That that is everything has been done that could have been done. Um, clearly. Um, if there is one, we will have to work our way through that. And yes, we would continue to pay the salaries. Um, and continue with the development costs um, as we work our way through to get, take this project to the stage where it's ready for construction. We have. Sorry. No, I was just going to. Sorry, I was just going to say that we have multiple um, critical path analysis done on this, um, on, uh, in terms of when it arrives at various points, depending on uh, questions of JR or not. If, if that JR came in and you're saying the salary costs would continue to be payable, what would those people be doing? Conscious of the fact that JR process can take quite a significant period of time. Well, those people would continue to do what they're currently doing, which is planning for the project. I want Jacqueline whether you want to add anything more to that. <coughs> Ironically, it's times mm -hmm. when there's activities such as a JR where the project salaries are probably earned more than at times when there's there's not a, a difficulty because a, a JR, JR, like any legal process, takes a lot of work to support. There'll be significant input as well from the uh, legal uh, advice colleagues and um, the project sponsor would, from the GA would be in control of managing that process for the project and the independent technical advisor would be responsible for pulling together all the technical information that would be required to support the JR from the other end. So ironically there would be a lot of work to do in that, that process. Um, initially, equally the SRO, we would be expecting a lot of engagement from the SRO with the department, because it, remembering that the, the GAA would be the lead defenders of the of the JR, so they would have to be having to assure the department that they're doing everything to, to defend the JR appropriately. So yes, their, their, their roles would continue and be very active. Just one last question, because as I said, a number of other questions were already dealt with. In terms of the, the clock around that judicial review, has that started and when does that sort of window close? Uh, is it when the decision notice is formally all done with the City Council or is that already started or what's the story with that, just to know where the window is for that? So the, basically once the um, planning is agreed, my understanding it's the 90 day following the, the actual planning permission, that correct, Jacqueline? There's a 90 day window. I mean, so. Okay, that's fine, thank you. Thank you, Mr Harvey. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> the concern that I would have is personnel turnover during a major project. What have you done to limit this? Yeah. Um, are you talking about personnel turnover within the department? Yes. Yeah. So, to be honest with you, there has been more turnover than we would have liked. Um, and you know, I, I can I can take you through the the detail on that. I mean, um, the first SRO uh, was 13, 13 to fifteen. That was Cynthia Smith. Cynthia um, then with the PAR recommendation, which was a full time SRO. Um, Ian May became 
um, the SRO, um, he had uh, significant um, qualifications in major projects. Unfortunately, um, Ian passed away in 2017, um, and the decision was taken um, to give some time before actually refilling that post. So there were two temporary um, SROs between 17 and 19, and then Moira came in in 2019. And uh, so ideally, you wouldn't be wanting that number of SROs in a project. Um, but unfortunately, that, that is the it. Um, Moira's, Moira's there for the... She's there now. She, Moira and I had this conversation, and she knows that, that's, that she's here to see this through. And what does the department have in terms of hand over training for personnel in terms of management, I guess, sir? Yeah, so Moira, um, she has a, do you know what's Moira's qualification? She has a qualification. ELP, pro project, project, project leadership program. Yeah, I was forgetting the names of them, but she has, she is qualified in terms of project. Um, and obviously then she's supported by Jacqueline, um, who is also, she's quantity surveyor. Um, and she's a diploma in project management, and she's Prince Two qualified. So we do have the appropriate qualifications in terms of those roles. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Boylan. Th uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, Chair, thanks for the clarification. Because I mean, clearly, as we go through this line of question, it's not to prefer the Tracy. It's not a case of social housing versus Casement Park. I mean, that's, that's a different matter. I understand the points Mr. Beggs made, but th this has been an agreement. You know, this has been going back a long time in terms of this project, but I do have some concerns. My colleagues raised the issue in relation to the time frame now that it sits with, with the council, and Mr Muir mentioned about a JR. In terms of what the, the department, what everybody's trying to do to, to try and, and reduce the, the impact of all of that, because, I mean, clearly there's a social capital value to all of this as well, and, and <coughs> the chair mentioned with Clonus. If it's not Crow Park on, a, on an all iron plane lay it, 80,000 people, the next best game would be the Ossifine and Clonus or, or either Casement Park, but close to 40,000 people. Those people who have never experienced it wants to be at it because it's, it's an excellent day out. And First I'm a keen, keen GAF on, but, but, but the social, the capital value from the GA in relation to those games is something. Like that. But I just want to ask in terms of what you are doing in relation to an endorsed council issue in terms of the application being handed over. Um, engagement council talking about the social capital, but also in the amount of years it's taken now, it's five or six years, the actual capital value has been lost in terms of the delays. And I'm not arguing the case or making a point about the JRs. Those processes are entitled to go, th go through the, the issues of, of the safety and all of those things. Just what we're doing in, in terms of trying and address some of those issues. Would you like to comment on that, please? So... You know, the, the, obviously, you know, there's no doubt that it's not an operation um, that has obviously been missed by many people. Um, what have we been doing? Well, obviously, the GAA are delivering the project. Yeah. We're obviously supporting them. And uh, um, my understanding is, you know, the GAA are um, continuing to engage with the community as appropriate. Um, and we certainly have this week had conversation with the GAA about the need for more a community engagement once the the planning commission comes um, actually comes through um, so in terms of the social capital I also know and I, I would it would just would comment that the GAA um, and, and members have been particularly active during COVID-19 and supporting community so um, I don't know whether that answers your question no it does and see in terms of maybe it can be answered in terms of the actual value we reckon we would have lost over the five or six years in terms of financial terms. I mean, obviously costs have gone up and the building costs will be the building costs, but, but in terms of, in terms right across the board, there has been a financial loss in terms of this not operating as well. Has, has that been considered at all? I think the, we are, we're doing a lot of work at the moment in terms of the benefits analysis, and I suppose that will, will help because when we see what the, this has, the, the benefits that this project has going forward will help us determine you know, what the opportunity here is, um, and a significant amount of effort has been gone into that. And, you know, it would be understandable. Members today have been asking questions as, you know, what are we getting for our extra money? 
Um, so what we're doing is we're, we're working very closely with the JAA around um, the benefits analysis to determine what the, the future benefits, both uh, social and economic, are um, in terms of also the original objectives to, to make it more sustainable uh, moving forward, um, to have a stadium which has both a, a national and international reputation and a stadium um, that actually supports the, the, the sport itself. Okay. Thank you, Mr Hilditch. Thanks, Sir, for letting me back in. It was a point that you'd raised yourself in relation to the uh, sub-regional area, uh, which is a, should be moving along side by side, because it also is part of a, an agreement, because football <coughs> got in around 63 million and it cost 18, 20 million to build Windsor. That rest of that money hasn't been spent as yet, so ordinary football through the country is somewhat behind the main area of football and GAA, to be honest. Is is there an actual timeline at the moment? Because the table I'm coming from here, there's, there's one club in my own constituency has had planning permission for five years sitting there and it's just run out. They've had much funding sitting there for the same amount of time. So you can guess the frustration that they and others are experiencing with this whole shenanigans over the sub-regional area. So what people would really like out there that we're not in the another capital project hames with this one. And, and people need answers because yeah. it's not good. <laughs> no, I and and I have I have actually experienced that frustration. Um I did visit a number of different um stadium. Yeah. And um what really struck me was how some of those are so deeply embedded in their communities in which they serve and the, the work that they're, that they're doing. So I think that all of that will be important when we're looking at um, the sub-regional. Um, I can't give you a time frame today, I'm sorry. Um, what I will do is tell you where we are and um, we can update you when I, when I get a, 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 a better time frame for you. And similarly, the, the, the GAA project is now, because of the time lapse, has moved from 77 to 112, whatever it is. That 36 has stayed there for a long, long time and it's not going to be worth the same value of work that it was meant to do 10 years ago or 8 years ago, whenever it was. And again, who's going to, who's going to lose out there? It's those communities that you refer to that the clubs are embedded in. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that, and that, <coughs> that issue has been, has been raised with the Minister on several occasions. Um, okay, Mr Beggs. <coughs> um, I'm just looking at the time frame. Um, the original project was tendered for in 2013 and we've been showing a 44-45% increase Now that's way, way above inflation. So um, I actually used to work in the peripheral of the construction industry and something that uh, was common, uh, commonly aware within the construction industry is that many companies made their profit not on the original quote but on the deviations or the extras. Uh, where they were frequently the, the sole person that were bidding for it. So my question is, how can you, know, how can we know that there is value for money based on uh, the fact that this was tendered seven years ago? Yeah, and uh, it's obviously really important that we do ensure that's the case. So we have used independent consultants to help us understand that those costs um, are um, reasonable and within benchmarks of what we expect. I don't know whether you want to go into more on that, Jacqueline. Yeah, there's a couple of things. Um, you'll be aware then that CPD have been using um, NEC contracts since 2006, design and build. And one of the benefits of the design and build contract is that it's not only the the allocation of risk between the contractor and the and the client, but also it's to develop. Um, it's what's called a lump sum fixed price contract, and any any variations from that are, are bound up by CEs. Uh, sorry, um, com compensation events. So that would have been done at the at the outset of the last construction project, and indeed any construction project. You get to a, you get to a point. You sign up your contract, and you sign up to the terms of that contract. Um, that would be the intention for this one as well. Once the costs are finalised, and once they're agreed and signed off and assured by ICPD, we will again be entering a design and build fixed price contract. And and the idea is that you get to a point. Because the contractor has an involvement in the, the late stage design of the project, uh, unlike a traditional form of contract where the, um, the design is totally done 
before tender, um, that the, the, the design, the contractor design will um, tie into the strict employer's requirements um, and that the design, the cost is more certain. So one of the benefits of CPDC with this type of contract is a <coughs> cost certainty. Um, so that's a, a mechanism that uh, the CPD and government projects across government have been doing to try to tie into that value aspect of the actual construction stage. Okay. Uh, I'm just going back to the 44-45% increase in, in, in cost. A significant part of the cost is the labour involved, the, the builders on site, and wages won't have increased 44-45% in the last seven years. So where is the extra money? Why is it costing so much? So um, my understanding is that 55% of the increased cost is inflation, and 45% is to do with the design. Um, and the design um, was the, the changes in design were very much to address the community issues. So, for example, um, the stadium now is completely enclosed, um, so to, to manage noise, I understand. Um, they had to basically excavate further um, underground to actually reduce the, the, the scale of the stadium. Um, so there was a number of design changes which w were to accommodate and, and try to make the stadium um, align better to the, the community requirements. Um, so 50, 55 and 45, isn't that correct, Jacqueline? And the public is expected to finance at least 80% of these additional costs? That's the, um, it's the, the agreement at the moment remains the, um, what, which, what's in the financial agreement, um, which is, it's 77.5 at 20, or 15, sorry, from the, um, the GAA. Thank you. James O'Toole. Thank you. This is a very brief one, Chair. Um, just on uh, business case and potential benefits, um, uh, given the day that's in it, we have uh, Northern Ireland are playing important match this evening, the Republic of Ireland are playing a friendly. Best of luck to both of them. One of the potential benefits of Caseman Park is a potential additional venue for major European Championship, or if, if there was a joint bid either on an all Ireland basis or with Scotland. I know there's a, one of those in the ether at the minute between, I think, the South and Scotland. Where are discussions on that, and is that one is that specifically one of the going to be in the, the potential business case? Because clearly, this would be the, the biggest stadium in Northern Ireland when it's built. Yeah, it's it would be the biggest stadium in Northern Ireland. Some of those would require a stadium bigger than that, was my understanding. Some of the, the games they were talking about recently would require a, a, a larger capacity, I think, than even a casement. Mm. I don't know, was there anything in the business case around other sports? N not at the moment, but not, not, for, not for that type of. But it would be a reasonable it would be a reasonable statement to make that it would massively increase our ability to yes. host yes. major international yes. football tournaments in Northern Ireland if up, this stadium up was to built. Three thousand four hundred, yes, up three thousand or sorry, yeah. five hundred, whatever. It'd be quite don't. difficult, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, can I ask them whether it's B eight guys will know better than that? Are they allowed to play other sports now? Yeah, they can ask that to that change yeah. now. Yeah, just it's fairly obvious that whenever in Go Park they have already hosted uh, international soccer games. Ah, yeah. uh, whenever the English fans come over and play the stadium, there were there. Off initial period. But I think and uh, what's, what's the rugby? Rugby. Well, the international rugby. So I'm sure that the GA themselves will be trying to in that respect. Not that I'm a spokesperson yeah. for the GA. I think. I think. I, I'm not uh, an expert or an authority on the GA's structure or management, but I presume you're having discussions with the Ulster GA. Is that right? Well, we're having discussions with the Ulster GA, but in fact, um, the Director General of the Central GA sits on the GA okay. project board. Mm -hmm. I would like to think, since there's considerable amount of public mm -hmm. money going into this, this stadium will be open to all, for all sports, and that, that you know, in your negotiations, that that's tied mm -hmm. down, because it would be completely wrong uh, for something that was be being used uh, 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 exclusively by one or two one sport or code. Okay. Um, can I just ask one question? In relation to the um, £10.5 million pounds that's been spent, 50% of that money was consultants, I understand. Um, why, why was that and who appointed those consultants? Do you want to take that one? That would be the ICT uh, and the uh, IST designs. Uh, yeah. Oh yes, is that, that the ICT consultant? Yes. So the ICT, the ICT, or effectively the design team. So it's the architects, the engineers, the project man managers, etc. They're tendered through CPD. So that would be the initial appointment at the time. Um, CPD employed them through the NIPPP public procurement. Okay. Route. 
All right. Well, I don't think any other members any questions. In terms of the, um, could, can I ask you both if you could come back to us regarding the sub-regional study in terms of um, maybe continuity around that and and, and uh, the monies potentially for them, and also the uh, sub-regional study group who, who those people are. If you don't mind. That would be um, uh, in terms of the. Um, I'll just make the point uh, as someone who I declare an interest as someone who goes to Irish League games. Uh, obviously, they're hugely constrained now in terms of the amount of people they can get in through the turnstiles. So, if monies could be raised from turnstiles, which I doubt, to to mean that uh, an enhancement of stadia, that is not the case now because obviously uh, I know my own club in terms of one of the games that it hosted at the start of the season lost five thousand pounds, which is not sustainable going forward. Uh, because of the, because of the regulations that the, in terms of health and safety and and um, uh, marshalling of the stadium, so I, I think the sub regional stadium stuff has now, in my opinion, uh, and others will have more knowledge of this than me, has now reached a hugely significant and important <laughs> period. As these monies need to start coming through, these clubs are all facing huge financial. Yeah, no, accepted. And obviously, we've just put out the the the, the COVID funding, the fifteen million pounds, which is so. Hopefully, that will help. But I appreciate all these applications sitting there ready to go. Yeah, and we're trying to recovery recover out of COVID at some stage with the construction industry and all these stadiums yeah. provide the work. And yeah, that. okay, thank you both very much, ladies. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, just where you go. Are there any members any questions that they want to ask? Uh, and that might be uh, answered uh, if they're of a sensitive nature in closed session. Everybody happy enough? Okay, thanks. Thank okay, members, I think there are a couple of things, a couple of things there. Um, that uh, we would need to um, perhaps a letter to Belfast City Council seeking clarity around the issue on the the, the blue light uh, regulations and so on. Um, I think that would be uh, important to get clarity on that because I, I don't think there was absolute clarity there around that. And to be honest, in terms of the police, the fire authority and the ambulance services and the Belfast City Council themselves because they have to give the certification because the stadium is inside Belfast City Council's bailiwick around that. Any other um, correspondence or questions members want to raise? Can I just check through the Chair? Uh, in, in fact, is that not included in the planning application itself to uh, planning in the Belfast City Council? Well, um, all I can tell you is that in, pre in, in previous times, there was very clear indications from the uh, from the, the, the blue light um, services uh, around their, their concern around the issue, uh, and I, I think, uh, and indeed, there was very clear. That we had the person in charge of health and safety, Belfast City Council and grounds, and the relevant director in front front of the old Cal committee around that. And Mr. Hillage will bear that out. So I think those are questions that we need to ask. You may well be right, but if, if that is the answer, then they will tell us that in writing. And I think that's something which this committee needs to ask. That particular time you referred to, the blue lights had been uh, lip service and then had been left to the side. Yeah. We just need to check it out. Hopefully it's the way it is. Thank you. For two. I, I wonder if it's worth us getting, and I don't know, it may be that it's already in the documentation, but just for that final question I asked about um, aids for major tournaments, whether that appears in the a business plan, and if there's a judgment on how that factors in, you know, for example, there was this talk. I don't know where it is, but the joint British-Irish bid for the 2030 World Cup. What that means, basically, for this would be our, you know, Northern Ireland's biggest stadium, obviously, and if, and if that is part of the plans. And also, the, and also the question around the uh, ask clar the department to give us clarification around the uh, use of the stadium. Okay, members agree? Right. Okay, members. Um, at this stage, then, um, if members are content, we're going to go into closed session. Members agree? Right. Assembly, committee room 30.